Welcome to Tennessee Court Talk. I'm your host, Barbara Peck, and today we are talking about recovery courts. This podcast is intended for all audiences. My first guest is Circuit Court Judge Tammy Harrington of the 5th Judicial District, which covers Blunt County. My second guest is Criminal Court Judge Jim Goodwin of the 2nd Judicial District, which covers Sullivan County. My third guest is Circuit Court Judge Beth Boniface of the 3rd Judicial District, which includes Green, Hamlin, Hyatt Hancock and Hawkins counties. My fourth guest is Circuit Court Judge Mike Pemberton of the 9th Judicial District, which includes Loudoun, Meggs, Morgan, and Rome counties. Welcome to all of you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Glad to be here. So everyone is always very enthusiastic to talk about recovery courts. I did not have to twist anyone's arm to be here today. Um, so Judge Harrington, let me start with you. What exactly is a recovery court and when does it come into play? A recovery court in our jurisdiction is a, uh, an opportunity. It usually comes about in our jurisdiction for those offenders that have already been a part of the system for a significant period of time. Obviously, their underlying uh, criminal behavior and offenses are because of uh, drug addiction or alcohol addiction. And uh, it's a program for nonviolent offenders. And there's a, an intensive screening process, not only for your criminal records, your current charges, but then also, um, are you clinically appropriate for the program? It's intensive. And in many jurisdictions, especially in ours, it is an alternative to prison. Judge Goodwin, what about in your district? Is it a similar setup? Pretty much the same. High risk, high need uh, offenders. You know, when I first thought about starting a recovery court, I thought, like I think a lot of people do, that, oh, I'm going to catch these folks at the very front end of their addiction, their very first time in the criminal justice system, and we'll make some changes and they won't come back. And it was a shock to find out, no, recovery court is just the opposite. Recovery court is to catch those folks who have a high risk to reoffend, a really high need for uh, treatment, and to catch them before they have to go spend a significant amount of time in the penitentiary. So it's not a first offender program. It's a, let's see if we can save these people before they're just totally lost. So how often, how many times on average would someone have been involved with the criminal justice system before they go through recovery court? I don't have an average. Uh, I know in, in our court, they have to have a felony conviction and they have to have a sufficient length of sentence that they can work their way through the program and have enough time to do that. And it takes 18 months, two years to really, to affect the kind of behavioral change uh, that we need. And Judge Harrington, you mentioned nonviolent offenses. So give me some examples of that. For our court, there's a large amount of burglaries, auto burglary, forgery, um, identity theft, uh, some uh, criminal possession. Our court is a felony court as well. And you have to have at least two years minimum to be able to complete the program. Obviously with high risk, high needs, it takes um, for our program a lot longer for some people than, than just the two years. And so when nonviolent offenders, um, again, think of uh, things that the behavior is to, to fuel that drug um, addiction. And so um, it, you would not see aggravated assault, you would not see rape, you would not see violent offenses. It's mostly property crimes. And then what's the process for, is it the defendant or the def defense attorney who makes that motion to, for this uh, per, per defendant to go to recovery court or is it the prosecutor, like who's involved in this decision? For our jurisdiction, we have a, a large um, recovery court. I average between 120 to 130 people. So when you take our population of our community, the public defender and the district attorney obviously sit on our team. They're heavily involved, our uh, criminal defense bar. So it, it is a process where anyone can bring the recovery court option to the table. And so, the DA might offer it as an alternative to a prison sentence. The yeah, defense attorney may come in and say, my, my person is finally interested in recovery court. Uh, it's offered and, and lots of times it's not taken the first time it's offered. People may go to prison and come back and reoffend, and then they're offered recovery court and they realize that maybe now's the time that I do need to take it. So that process uh, happens for a lot of reasons. It may be a probation officer that suggests that recovery court is an option. And then the process begins. We have referral forms that are in the courtrooms, be that Sessions Court, Circuit Court, Criminal Court, and those are um, processed. The, uh, they're sent to the Recovery Court Office. A criminal history 
is obtained and then it's sent to the district attorney for them to have that first review of whether or not their charges are appropriate. And Judge Boniface, tell us a little bit about your court. So we have currently about 40 people in our court. Um, we meet weekly. Uh, we have very intensive oversight. Um, one of the nice parts about our court is the community has really gotten involved with our court. We have the Chamber of Commerce. Um, the head of that came to our court the other day because he had employers that were talking to him about the fact that our participants are the best employees that they've had. And they're like, we need to get this out to everyone and let them know that this is a great um, place to find employees. And so we've really gotten a lot of community support. Um, our county uh, commission is completely behind us. They recently have purchased two homes for us so that we can have sober living homes. That's one of our biggest challenges is finding housing for these people. So, um, you know, I think that's one of the really defining parts of our court is how the community has really offered up a lot of support. Okay, so so criminal court happens sort of at sentencing as an alternative sentencing. Instead of going to jail, you're going to accept recovery court. So what exactly is it, a participant gonna do in recovery court? In our recovery court, ours is a little different because we have partnered with our sheriff's department to uh, provide a stabilization phase. Uh, years ago, we did not have access to inpatient treatment that we needed because uh, as uh, they've talked about, these are high risk, high needs offenders and to have an inpatient component became really important for us. And so we have a stabilization phase where for the first six weeks, they work, uh, they're incarcerated, but they're in treatment and our treatment providers go to the uh, Blunt County detention facility and provide inpatient treatment. We have Helen Ross McNabb who goes in and, and maybe does a mental health evaluation. We then start assessing where they're going to live because we have trouble finding appropriate safe housing. And uh, we have a foundation that, that works with our men's house and, and our women's house and they run those. And so you, for, you complete that stabilization phase and then you start what is a four phase program and then aftercare. Each of our phases is designed to um, ultimately lead to independence and long-term sobriety. So for the first phase, you're gonna do intensive outpatient. When you first get out, you're going to more likely than not live in one of the foundation sober living homes. Um, you cannot seek employment for the first few days, but uh, as Judge Boniface had stated, we have a very good relationship with our local employers. Years ago, it was a problem to get um, jobs. Now um, our uh, participants are in high demand by our local companies, which has been just a blessing. You're going to start individual treatment. You're going to be in group treatment. You're going to have classes. You um, are going to be um, subjected to a random drug screen on a daily basis. And uh, you start that process. You have outside meetings. You have meetings at your halfway house. And so uh, you come to court every week. So our program begins, there is not a much free time. And that continues into phase two. As you get into phase three, there might be more free time. Uh, it is structured that when we step back as far as less group treatment, your requirements of outside AANA meetings increase. And so the idea is that uh, you become part of a sober living community as you advance through the program. Ours includes life skills. Um, at certain phases, you're required to have a checking account. At certain phases, you're required to adhere to a budget. So we say recovery court, but it, it really, and I'm sure it is for everyone else, is life court. It, it is really trying to uh, hold individuals accountable as citizens and clean and sober citizens. And oftentimes you have individuals that, that have never done that before. And so you have to be there every step of the way to teach those skills. Um, it takes some time, but uh, with those first successes, you do get more motivation. And Judge Goodwin, what about, is your court similar? Like it's, it's very similar. I think we, in this second phase, as they get later on, they're actually required to work. Uh, they're required to hit that budget and get that out there, but kind of pretty quickly. Um, and they're required to pay fines and costs um, as part of the program. And what's interesting is that, yeah, it is a life 
court. You know, I think that's a really great way to say it. But these folks, for the most part, have never had someone in authority ever tell them that they were worth anything. They've never had someone, say a judge, a father, a mother, tell them that they're proud of them. And something as simple as those words make a huge impact in, in the motivation and, and getting the folks to, to do what they, they need to do. We get to a certain point in our program and, and our participants will even say that, that they understand that accountability starts to feel good. Yeah. That, that they've always fought accountability or fought a responsibility, but there is a transition, especially with incentives and the praise and, and being part of a community, but that they will actually come to realize that accountability and adhering to requirements feels good. So what is your role as a judge in a recovery court? I think the role is to, um, like they said, you give guidance, but you also give a lot of praise. And they come into my court and they're so nervous. The participants can't speak. Some of them were like literally shaking because every time that they've been in court, it has been an extremely negative experience for them. So when they come into my court, I try to at first get them to get at ease a little bit. Um, you have to hold them accountable, but at the same point, you also have to tell them, wow, you did great today. You got a raise and they are so proud of themselves. You got your GED, well, your high set now. Um, that's a big thing, you know, for them to achieve that. We help them try to get their license back, you know, and so you do a lot of praise. And um, like I said, though, if they slip and they will, I mean, it's not a straight line process. You definitely have to hold them accountable, but also I think you have to let them know that that was a one-time slip. It doesn't mean that we now think you're a certain type of person, like you're not going to make it. Or they, a lot of times they get into the mindset of, oh, I messed up. I'm not going to even try anymore. So you have to kind of bring them out of that mentality and get them back on the positive side. So is relapse part of the process? Absolutely. That's what I, and especially if you look at different phases. Phase one, um, when you first get them in, a lot of people are gonna have a, I mean, they don't have any skills yet. We haven't gotten them the help that they need. So you'll have a lot of relapse in phase one. Now, they start doing it in phase five, then you're looking at the self-sabotage, you know? Why do you wanna put yourself back in trouble? Um, and so there may be some other therapy and things like that that you have to address, because they shouldn't be relapsing once they get to that stage. I will say this, the relapse and the mistakes they do serve a purpose uh, for a lot of participants in that they are so used to making a mistake or failing a drug screen and then running from the consequence because it's going to be locked up, thrown away. And so that first relapse or that first mistake and they come to court and we deal with it and we move on is really that first step in, tr step in trusting the process. So you see a lot of people that are, are very skeptical and they're fighting the process and then they realize wait a minute, perfection is not expected. They're not going to throw me away. They're still going to be here for me. And then you start getting that buy-in because you have offenders that have been a part of the process for years and years, and they don't trust it. Um, I have a lot of people that have never voluntarily walked through a courtroom door. They've always come in through the jail side. And so little by little, when they start realizing, wait a minute, they're not gonna throw me away, you start being able to make more progress. So, Ms. Pemberton, so tell us about your court, because I know your, your recovery court is a little bit different than the other three judges. So tell us about yours. Well, it is. It's a lot different there. I run, well, I don't run. I work with a residential recovery court um, that takes folks from the other frontline, what I call frontline drug courts, three of which you've just heard from. But we take folks from Mountain City to Memphis uh, that have, for whatever reason or reasons, have uh, flunked out of their local drug court, but yet the drug uh, uh, court, the, the judge or the and the uh, team there in the local drug court think that this particular individual still has a shot rather than being sent straight to prison. So they send them to us where we will keep them and work with them in a very intensive inpatient environment for at least a year 
and they and sometimes longer than a year. Um, and I, 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 while I certainly agree with the judges who have just spoken about it being a life court, for a lot of folks, it's a life or death court. Uh, is the reality, uh, and so our court is different. These folks are on the front lines. We're sort of the backline last resort before going to prison for a long time. Uh, and so we get these folks, uh, men, uh, uh, and we keep them for at least a year and they go through an intensive program uh, during that period of time. Residential, they don't leave. And so have all of the other three judges, have you referred participants to Judge P Pemberton's court? And at what point do you do that? And he's right. It's sort of the last resort. You're, you're sitting there and you've got a participant and you've tried everything that you know to do and you're still scratching your head at the fact that they're just not getting it. Um, so we can refer them to Morgan County and, um, you know, they've got one more shot before they have to go serve whatever prison sentence they have. Okay, so we talked a little bit about, obviously, Judge Pemberton's court is an in, inpatient process but the three of you also talked about housing in for your own court so talk a little bit about like why is housing important i know for with other recovery court judges that we've talked to it's often an issue um and it's a hard one to find because it's you know expensive and you have to find a place for people to live so we'll talk a little bit about the the need for housing and how you handle that in your recovery court i think it's the number one issue um to quote another um, recovery court judge that i respect and, and kind of look up to if you can't change their playground and their playmates, you have a really uphill battle. If you're, you may not even, you may not even get there. Um, so housing, if you if you can't change where they live, where they are, and the people that they associate with, then you just you're 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 basically setting them up for failure. And you know, when I first started my program, we had a community corrections program one of the few in the state that had a residential component to it. So when I first started my recovery court, everybody went from the jail to what we call the Hay House, and they were in a residential facility. Um, and, and in about 2019, that went away. And the need for housing really hit home. And it, it's, it's difficult. Uh, I'm totally envious, envious of Blount County uh, they have a foundation, they have their own uh, sober living. We we have to rely on what uh, sober living houses called Oxford Houses. And we've recently partnered with uh, Recovery Resources. Um, they're an organization that has housing for men that the many of the sober living houses basically have one of the participants who live there basically is their president and then that person sort of runs the house. With recovery resources, and the beautiful thing about Morgan County is you don't have that. You have, you have a house or a facility that is actually run by professionals, um, not the people who live there. So that, that's one of our biggest hurdles, it is, is getting appropriate housing. We could have more people in our program um, if we had housing. I only have one. Uh, it's called mats and they're very wonderful you have to meet certain criteria but you can get we can place them in mats um, and there's also breath of life ministries um, but those are the only two places and breath of life is only for males um, and mats is a very you can only stay for a short period of time and so we we really could not sometimes get people into the program we had absolutely nowhere to put them uh, the rental house market is insane in our area um, and so with the two new houses that luckily the, um, the opioid settlement allowed us, the county was very gracious. They gave also to the um, Carter County new inpatient that they're going to do up there with Jim Goodwin and Judge Strait and Judge Rice. Um, but they also gave me enough money to buy two different homes. But without that, our program, we were stopped because there's nowhere to put people. Absolutely nowhere. And from the recovery court standpoint, the residential recovery court standpoint, obviously we have them housing 12 months or longer, but then when they successfully complete our program, we send them back to the local drug court program from where they came and 
from our perspective, the number one indicator of future success of those folks that we send back is stable housing. And, and, the, and the drug courts, that the, the local drug courts that have the housing component, uh, the folks that we send back have the greatest chance of future success. And they can go to that housing and they can continue to move along in their program with the local drug court until ultimately they will graduate from that program just like they graduated from our residential programs. So when we get our participants from Morgan County, when they come back to us, they go automatically to our men's apartment complex. That is part of the foundation. And so it is very important. And even when they come in to visit, they stay at our men's apartments and sober living. And so that's an automatic pipeline that when you come back from Morgan County, you're going to our men's sober living apartment complex. So you talked about the foundation. It's, it's interesting. I'm not sure how many recovery courts have a foundation, but it was a in the works when I took the bench in 2011, and then they asked that we continue to try to, to achieve that goal of a, of a 501c3. The only way that we were able to do that was because of our participants. Obviously, when you go to the community and you ask for money for drug addicts, it's not a popular cause. It is not well received. And so we tried to be creative in how do we educate the community so we started a public speaking tour with our participants. We went to Kiwanis, we went to Rotary, we went to the leadership, uh, Blunt and some of the other organizations. Then the next thing you know, we're invited to the schools. And so we're there speaking to the seventh graders. We're there the day of prom. And we found through all of this that no one wanted to hear from us. They don't wanna hear from judges. They don't wanna hear from DAs. They wanna hear from the participants. And so through that uh, process, we got a lot of community support and we're able to start the 501c3. We started with one single house that quite honestly was bought by one of our graduates and leased back to the program. And then as we proceeded on, um, we were able to then another, uh, some a person uh, bought an apartment complex, leased that back to the program. And what's really interesting about it is our foundation runs the houses. We have graduates that work at the houses, full-time staff members that work at those sober living placements, but our participants pay rent and, and they pay the, the, the foundation. Um, they may uh, receive a grant or a scholarship for a down payment because oftentimes they don't have anyone to, to do that for them. But in our program, very early on, if you're not employed full-time, you're doing the equivalent amount of community service. And it doesn't take but a minute to realize you don't want to work for free. And so, uh, and if you get behind on your rent, then you're placed on restrictions and on all of those issues. So it really was a blessing. Some of our people, we, we can't leave them in Blount County in the beginning. So we, we partner with Iron Gate, which is a program in Knoxville that was started by one of our graduates, which has become very successful. And then Jelnick, possibly Cadis in Chattanooga. What I have found is, is it was difficult and a little overwhelming when we got so big having so many participants, but the bigger we, we have become, the more resources we have through our graduates and through our participants and through just the sheer fact that we have to partner with so many places. And one thing that I think the public is beginning to understand and it certainly elected officials are beginning to understand is that drug courts ultimately save taxpayer dollars. First and foremost, it's about saving human beings. It's about saving lives, but it also saves taxpayer dollars. Most of the folks that we get that are referred to us at the recovery court in Morgan County have multiple prison year, multiple year prison sentences that they would be serving. Okay. And the numbers you know, for serving a, a, in prison, I'm told that it's somewhere between maybe 30 to $33,000 a year that it costs the state of Tennessee. Well, I don't know for, for what the cost is for the local drug courts, but for our drug court, we can do that, our whole program for about eighteen, nineteen thousand dollars $19,000 a year per participant. And I tell them when they come in, they don't realize how lucky they are to be here. 
because there's only three of these, soon to be four, with Carter County coming online, residential programs. There's only three residential programs in the state, two for males, one for females that just opened in Nashville about a year ago. But I tell them that somewhere, somebody believed in them enough to send them to this court because if they had this problem and were not in the criminal justice system and they had to go out and pay for a year-long residential treatment, they would be spending a quarter of a million or more dollars to pay for that. We do it for 19, 18, 19, 20 thousand dollars a year, cost to the taxpayers. That's for one year. They come to us with multiple year prison sentences. Do the math. Three times 30 something is 90 something thousand. We do it for 19 or 20 or thereabouts. And so convincing elected officials, I think, ha ha may have been a problem in the past. And I'm sure that the housing component is the most expensive component for the, I assume, guys, for the local drug courts. But the dollars and cents really make sense from the from the taxpayer perspective once you show it. And I can give an example. We have a, a graduate that went through the Morgan County Residential Recovery Court program. He has a 25 year sentence, 25 years. And he completed that program, came back to us in phase three. This has been many years ago, many years ago, and now is employed by our foundation, works for our men's sober living house and uh, uh, runs the meetings the AANA meetings um, and is, is heavily involved in the program. But when you take just one person and the cost of incarceration for 25 years, and this individual is, is working, paying taxes, raising his children, and not only that, giving back to the community through the foundation and is heavily involved, I think that's a prime example of the cost benefit, uh, and especially even working with both programs. Exactly. I mean, that, that's that's probably the best example I've heard. You mentioned a little bit about employers. So at what phase do you, in your programs, at what phase does, does a participant have to be employed? And then what what kind of what kind of employers do they often go to? And how are, how do employers interact, inter, interact with your program? Everybody's looking at me. <laughs> so in, in our in our court, um, they can work in phase two. They have to be working by phase three. Um, I don't know about the other courts, but we have a slight difference in ours. Um, you, most of them were working in phase one. To tell you the truth, um, they get out and they start working. But we also allow if they're doing um, full time education, TCAT. We've got several people at TCAT. So not only when they come out of this program will they be sober and uh, good employees, they also will actually have a skill. I mean, they can set up their own business if they want to. We've got a welder. We've got um, one of our female is doing the um, it's a auto mechanic thing for big trucks. I don't know what you call that. Um, but so if they're doing that, they don't have to have a job. If they don't, if they're not going to education, then they do have to have a job. And most of them have it in phase one, but they absolutely have to have it by phase three. Ours is when you, when you come out, you're the first two weeks, you're an intensive outpatient. And then after that, you have to seek full-time employment. We have a uh, employment agency that we work with called GEAR in, in Blunt County. They staff several of our graduates that help with the placement. And uh, they work not just with us, they work with the Knox County community. They serve a homeless population, other recovery courts, but they partner with several companies and uh, it's really an amazing program. They will help you find your steel toe boots. They will walk you to the floor of the factory the first few days that you're there. And uh, they really have an understanding of, of what it's like to have not worked in that kind of environment and to help with that. Then we also have several employers that we have sent recovery court participants to over the years. They've done a good job and by word of mouth, hey, do you know anyone else that wants to work here? And so we have several companies that uh, we have several participants uh, working there. Then the uh, COVID crisis and the employment crisis was really beneficial to us. When people were looking for workers, we had them. And then they realized, wait a minute, someone else is going to be drug screening them. Someone else is going to be supervising them. Someone else is going to hold them accountable if they don't show up for work. 
and, and it's a sanction in our program if you quit a job without notice, if you leave a job for another job and, and you don't uh, do that appropriately. And so then we had people calling us, hey, do you have anybody that might want to go to heavy equipment operator school? We're willing to pay their tuition if they'll maybe want to sign on with us for a couple of years. And it became just a, a wonderful really a benefit to our um, individuals to be able to have these opportunities at careers. And so we have Rubbermaid, Denso, uh, a lot of different corporations that uh, employ our people. So uh, again, COVID was good to us. We, we have several companies uh, up in Sullivan County that uh, it, it's just exactly like you said, you know, they hired one of our participants. They realized, hey, wait, they're getting drug screened how many times a week? Yes. You know, so, and it's the same thing. It's word of mouth. It's like, hey, do you have other people who you, you can, you know, in your program you can bring to us? And so we, we have had that same experience. I think they realize that they have a certain part of the population that's using that that's not being supervised. So they had a lot of uh, sickness, a lot of call-ins, a lot of things just with the general working population. And so then they realized, wait a minute. This is a much easier route to take. Yeah, much, much easier. Well, and a sober employee is generally a productive employee. Well, and if you get a sanction for not showing up at work, um, you're going to go to work. And that is all the employers that want somebody there that is, you know, reliable. So, so in addition to employers, and we talked a little bit about the foundations, but how else do, do your programs interact with the community? And why do you need community support for your programs? Basically, uh, the, the interaction that we've had is that my director and I will go to different civic groups, um, have presentations, just to kind of get the word out so people know. I go talk to the lawyers all the time because we're wanting, you know, the, the lawyers are the ones who typically send us the uh, participants. Uh, it can be others, as uh, Judge Harrington said, but um, so we go to the Bar Association meetings and reach out to those folks. We send our participants to uh, job fairs through the probation office quite regularly. So, I think also the community support for uh, medical, dental, some of that is very important. Um, and so we also have to try to say, look, we've got this population that could really use your help. So. And oftentimes, I mean, people come into your programs with basically nothing. Mm -hmm. I mean, no. nothing. So it's not just they need a place to live they don't have i'm assuming bedding and pots yeah. and clothes shoes and yes dental yeah. care and and things dental like dental care is that. huge and so you, you mean you must need a lot of community partners then to sort of help get these people in a position where they're ready to work and ready to be open to treatment and and benefit from treatment because obviously if you're in need of root canals, you probably are going to be struggling with your therapy, I would assume, having done it. It's kind of painful. It's not the therapy, but the root canal. <laughs> so I think that... Sometimes, sometimes both are painful. Yes, both are <laughs> If you're doing it right. Yes. Yeah. So I think I think a lot of community support would probably um, be helpful. I mean, and obviously, like, even just, like, clothes and things like that, to clothes yeah. to wear to work, you want me to work, but, I mean, I've been living on the streets and breaking into cars mm -hmm. for the last six months, so how am I supposed to... Um, you know, have clothes to go to work or all of that. And what about um, the inpatient facility? How do you sort of work with the communities? Everything sort of included in yours? Or did you have partners and stuff as well? Our facility, obviously, they, they, they don't work. Uh, well, they work, but they don't work out, outside mm -hmm. the facility. They uh, have about four hours a day of class and group and, and therapy and things of that nature. And then uh, we grow up, we grow all of our own vegetables. I mean, we, we have a woodworking shop. We, as I said, we have a, I don't know, three or four acre garden. Uh, the in the uh, uh, inpatient folks, uh, they, they do the cooking. I mean, they do everything in that regard. But a substantial component of their recovery is community service. Uh, we can't do the, the work component because these are folks who who haven't succeeded at the at at the local drug court, so we don't do that. But we do a lot of uh, community work for churches and schools and things of that nature. Particularly in, at schools in the summer, uh, we'll go out and uh, and do whatever we are asked to do, pretty much depending upon the skill level of the people that we have there at the current time. 
Uh, but one thing that, that I do want to touch on is, is you were talking about what do these folks need. Uh, it's interesting, from, and I mentioned this before we went on the air, that from the time we get them until the time that they graduate from our program and we send them back to their local drug court, you, it's hard sometimes to even recognize the person that walks out from the person that walked in. Our average weight gain from, from, from the time we get them to the time we, they leave us is 47 pounds. And that's not because they are just sitting around eating, okay? It's because they come in basically emaciated and uh, have substantial dental problems and things of that nature. Uh, so, I mean, it, it's a, it's a life-changing experience, bottom line. That's the goal. That's what we want it to be. So for all of you um, as judges, I want you all to answer this, this question on, on your own, but, but why do you do this? Because my understanding is you're not getting any extra pay for this. I mean, you're, you're meeting people every week and you already have busy dockets and I've added this docket, this, this recovery court docket. Um, you don't get any extra money. You, it's a lot of extra work. So why? And I'll start with you, Judge Goodwin, because you said you started your recovery court. I mean, why? Why do you do it? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you about. I think she was the third person that we brought into our court. I'm not gonna tell you her name, but she had been using very heavily for a long time, committing crimes. She had lost her husband. She had lost her kids. Uh, she had spent a considerable time amount of time in the Sullivan County Jail, and. When her lawyer asked her if she wanted to try this new program called Recovery Court, she was like, you know, this is the way I can get out of jail. The way I can get out of jail. She, and, and, and in her mind, she's, and she's told me all of this, but in her mind, it was, I can get out of jail right now. There's no way that I can make it. I mean, I will not complete this program. But for now, I'm out of jail. So she came for a couple of weeks, struggled, but she came and she listened and she started participating in the group and she started to buy in very slowly. And at some point she decided, well, if I'm going to be here. I might as well try. And she works her way through the program. But once that light went off, in her own mind, she did really well. She never relapsed after that. I, she may have relapsed once before that, but I, I don't recall. So we get to graduation and she's one of the first people who graduate. And at this point, she not only has a job, she's a regional manager for a uh, a chain of restaurants. She's not only in a relationship, she got her, her and her husband reunited because he got clean and sober. After she graduated, she got her kids back and she's continued to flourish ever since. And I thought, you know, this is a great story and I can, I can, you know, I can tell folks about her and it's really good for the program. Well, she came back to the second or third graduation just to show support. And we got to talking and she said, you know, right before I got this paperwork, I was very, very seriously considering taking my life because I had nothing left to live for. I've lost my husband, lost my kids. There was nothing in life for me anymore. And the reason I do this is because of folks like her. This program saved her life, not just because it got her off drugs, but it gave her purpose. And for all the heartache, for all the headaches, um, for all those days where you have to go in there and every single participant has had a bad week, I think about this one person and I know that we're saving lives. I mean, I, it's not that, well, research shows that you're saving lives or anecdotally you're saving life. No, I know we saved her life. And that's why I do it. 
I mean, and Judge Boniface, so you don't even have criminal court jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. You are a civil court judge. <laughs> So yes. why why do you why do you do this? Why did you raise your hand and say, you know what, I'm going to be the one that's going to do our recovery court? Um, the mayor came to me and he said, look, we used to have a misdemeanor court. We want to make it a felony court, and um, we think you would be the right fit. I uh, I was hesitant, like you said, I, I don't do criminal work at all. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll give it a shot. But I absolutely. Um, People that come into our program are broken. They're, they've had such a tremendous amount of trauma in their lives, and they've had no ability um, or help to get the treatment that they need. And so when they come into my court, I see this person, and it's just, it's a shell of a person. And the wonderful part is as we all work together as a team, you start to see this person really grow. I have a guy that was in our, um, he's in his 40s, he had never, since the age of 18, been out of jail for Thanksgiving. He has now been out of jail for two consecutive Thanksgivings. His family is put back together. We had court the other day and we had another baby shower. And we had three um, babies that were there. Everybody brought their babies that had been born, born during the recovery court process. And they were all clean. They were born clean. Um, and so you get all these wonderful um, moments where you can see that this person that just had no faith in themselves whatsoever uh, really has grown and and it just, it makes you feel wonderful to be just even a little bit of that, just to be a part of it. So no, we don't get money for it, but um, I would lie if I said that I'm not getting paid because emotionally I get paid every day that I go to court, even on the tough days, but it's just a wonderful, wonderful to be a part of somebody's life in a positive way. Judge Pemberton. Well, I'm going to quote Judge Seth Norman. As all of us know, Judge Norman was a pioneer in, in drug courts and residential recovery courts, having started DC4 in Nashville and having started the court that I work with in Morgan County. And Judge Norman always says, these are good people with a bad problem that we give them the tools to help themselves. And I think that's true. That's what we do. As to why we do it, I, you know, I, I, it's pretty simple to me. It's the right thing to do. Judge Harrington? I would echo what everyone else has, has said. It is very rewarding. It places you um, in a position to make a difference in your community in a, in a completely unique way. And so lots of times when we go speak to our community, I, I will start with saying, you know, we have so many people in the Blount County Jail right now. and if you don't think that they are part of this community, then, then you're fooling yourself because just locking someone up and ignoring them it does not change the fact that eventually they are going to get out and they are, they are going to be in this community. And so to, to ignore that um, is really unrealistic. And so we have um, our individuals and uh, come to us in a lot of dysfunction. But I always talk about it in recovery court. I, I end up saying it almost every week. We may be a dysfunctional family from the outside looking in, but we are a functioning family. And, and being a part of that, being a part of those changes, those successes, but then also being there for the hard times to, to help someone navigate their way through that it is very rewarding. And it is, it is a way to make a substantial and a long lasting difference not only for the safety of your community, but a difference for families who are, are you know, children that are reunited with their parents, um, parents who come in and, and they don't have to wait on that phone call in the middle of the night thinking that their child has, has OD'd somewhere, um, employers that come to us and say, thank you. But, but then those individuals that, that just have that sense of pride in their accomplishments and they're not thrown away anymore. It is a, an extremely rewarding experience to be a part of all of their hard work. We don't do the work, they do the work. And, and so I think that that's important to recognize that part of it. Great, well, thank you all for being guests on this edition of Tennessee Court Talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.